Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. And um, so I'm going to continue the theme of, of third space endoscopy with a couple of different acronyms, uh, submucosal tunneling, endoscopic resection, uh, and peroral pyloromyotomy, and give you an update on each. Uh, these are my disclosures, none of which are, are pertinent to my talk this morning. So what I'd, I'd like to talk about in kind of two different topics uh, for STIR uh, is look at applications and what that uh, technique is being applied to and, and maybe some early experience and data. And then for peroral pyloromyotomy, uh, also known as G-POEM, gastric peroral uh, endoscopic myotomy, uh, technique and outcomes, there's a little more data on that. <clears throat> so. Continuing with the, the topic of the session, uh, intramural surgery is, is neither luminal, which is standard endoscopy, or, or cavitary, like laparoscopy, but it's really a third space. And Silvana talked about this, uh, and it's a new realm of access that we use an endoscope uh, to perform surgical procedures uh, within the wall of the GI tract. And what's allowing us to do this? Well. Platforms, uh, endoscopic platforms, are allowing us to do more complex procedures uh, in uh, the confines of either the luminal GI tract or within the wall of the GI tract, and instrumentation. So the tools, such as this triangle tip knife, uh, IT insulated tip knife, uh, or hook knife that you've seen, are starting to look much more like our laparoscopic instruments uh, to divide, uh, retract, uh, as with the cap, uh, and perform surgical procedures on the end of an endoscope. So really, this is the, uh, the confluence of, of surgery and endoscopy and is surgical endoscopy. So if we look at this kind of smattering of acronyms, uh, and it gets to be quite confusing, there's local regional uh, preference in terms of what all this means. For STIR, submucosal tunneling endoscopic resection, we're really looking at submucosal tumors, and I'll talk about that in a bit, but we're looking at endoscopic resection. And there's different ways to access uh, these tumors of the GI tract, and I'll mainly talk about upper uh, tract uh, lesions. Endoscopic submucosal dissection um, is really a mucosal-based uh, technique, but really spurred a, a lot of the intramural surgery we'll talk about in this section endoscopic submucosal excavation, endoscopic full thickness resection, which I think is uh, one of the upcoming talks, and then I'm going to talk about SIR, which is submucosal tunneling endoscopic resection. So what are the advantages of these? Well, it's very similar to what our surgical specimens are. It allows us to, to generate definitive histology for these otherwise um, uh, sometimes challenging submucosal tumors. There is a potential sampling error on EUS with FNA, and uh, obviously it's therapeutic as well for patients who want these lesions removed. So STIR is a novel approach really to submucosal tumors, SMTs of the upper GI tract, esophagus and stomach for the most part. It's applied to lesions that are often less than three centimeters of size. It seems to be uh, a reasonable and optimal size for a section. Uh, some of these lesions may have malignant potential. Most commonly, these are gastrointestinal stromal tumors um, uh, that could progress to uh, malignancy. Uh, and for these small lesions uh, that uh, sometimes may be considered uh, insignificant, there is uh, a requirement for endoscopic surveillance, and this involves time, uh, cost, and, and, and patient uh, stress for continued uh, evaluation. So stir indications are for submucosal tumors of the upper tract. They typically arise from the muscularis propria. Maximal size is three to five centimeters, and these should not have any extra luminal component and no features suggestive of malignancy. The advantages, I think, are probably obvious to this group, but avoids surgical intervention. Um, a submucosal tunnel uh, allows us to, to access to the targeted lesion. It maintains integrity of the esophagus or stomach by keeping the mucosa intact uh, and allows for on-block resection. Uh, and potentially, there's some data that shows that it might have lower leak rates. So, the technique uh, involves a submucosal injection, access to the submucosal plane above uh, the muscular layers. Uh, the submucosal tunnel is facilitated by a cap. Uh, the lesion is dissected, uh, removed, coagulation of vessels, and mucosal closure. 
All right, talk about data. Uh, most of the studies are, are smaller single institution groups. This is uh, efficacy and safety uh, and a systematic review and meta-analysis, 28 studies, more than 1,000 lesions, on-block resection rates uh, near 100%. Um, complications are not unexpected, subcutaneous emphysema, pneumoperitoneum, mediastinum, and perforation, bleeding, all low uh, and I think acceptable. How about longer term outcomes? This is another uh, uh, collated study of, of 16 uh, studies, 700 lesions, highly variable complication rates depending on definitions, but recurrence rate was zero in this group and, and the, the follow-up rate obviously varied based on institution and study. Okay, so STIR is a good um, uh, minimally invasive mechanism to access some mucosal tumors of the, the uh, proximal GI tract. How about POP? So uh, in terms of uh, applications of intramural surgery to pyloromyotomy, gastroparesis is a vexing disease, a spectrum of medical and surgical therapies, uh, and uh, can range from uh, relatively uh, mild symptoms to severe, in, in including dehydration, uh, nutritional failure, uh, electrolyte imbalance. Surgical therapies are spectrum, sometimes they're palliative in terms of decompression, feeding access, but gastrectomy, stimulators, and pyloroplasty. Gastric electrical stimulation is an option for some patients, tends to be better for diabetic patients, uh, a laparoscopic procedure, but obviously implanting the device, even with success, uh, this is a study by Fred Brody's group at GW, uh, almost half those patients required an additional operation at some point, uh, even if it is just a battery exchange. So not insignificant re-interventions. Our group published um, rue reconstruction for gastroparesis, but the morbidity uh, of this procedure is quite high. Um, and uh, it can be quite problematic for these patients. So uh, how do we get to POP? Well, um, this is the Portland group. They published a series looking at laparoscopic pyloroplasty for gastroparesis, and as a, a well-respected group of uh, surgical endoscopists, then they applied that same principle to the end of an endoscope, looking at the early human experience with peroral endoscopic pyloromyotomy. So what does this look like? It's similar to POEM, but shorter. It's accessing the submucosal plane above the muscular layer, uh, tunneling, dividing the pylorus, coming back and closing the submucosal tunnel. So since it's early in the morning, and I figure maybe we can engage you a bit, I'll show a video. Uh, this is how our team does the uh, uh, pop. It's, we uh, prefer the lesser curve uh, approach. This patient has a, a, a peg with a jejunal extension. It's a lung transplant patient who's having a current aspiration pneumonia. So we take a, a sclerotherapy needle and inject blue dye to raise the wheel, about five centimeters proximal to the uh, pylorus on the long lesser curve. We use a, a triangle tip knife. The mucosa of the stomach is thicker than the esophagus, and we really perform a, a transverse incision instead of a longitudinal incision, which we do for POEM. Uh, allows us to access that um, submucosal plane a little bit easier and develop a, a flap pushing downwards along the lesser curve of the stomach. So repeat injection, uh, and then the cap allows us to access that submucosal plane. The CO2 insufflation allows for that loose areolar tissue to kind of billow up, uh, and we use uh, a spray coag uh, to dissect away the mucosa from the underlying uh, muscle. Um, Re-injection to identify the difference between that loose areolar tissue, the mucosa, and the muscle makes those planes a little bit easier and actually does a nice dissection as well, which you'll see here. When we come down to the pylorus, it's quite obvious what that looks like. In some ways, it looks like a, a ring of calamari, I think. Um, but you can see the white muscular layer there, uh, and we divide that usually distal from the duodenum back onto the stomach for one or two centimeters um, uh, with division of those muscular fibers. Similar to POEM, it's, it's very um, uh, controlled, and you can see the, the fibers separate, and the cap will allow for lateral dissection. Um, the duodenum is quite thin. You want to be careful that the distal aspect of your dissection perforation can occur, but like in POEM, uh, pneumoperitoneum can be decompressed if needed and uh, if there's any effect on uh, hemodynamics of, of the patient. So again, short tunnel, four centimeters along the lesser curve. A uh, series of probably three to five clips to close that transverse incision. Uh, and uh, patients, it's done under general anesthesia. It typically takes about 30 minutes to do. It's shorter than a poem because the, the uh, muscular division and length of the myotomy is shorter overall.
All right, how about outcomes? So this is our experience uh, from Cleveland Clinic. Uh, our first 100 patients over the course of two years. We looked at GCSI and uh, non-extrapolated four-hour solid phase gastric emptying study pre and three months post-op. If you look at the demographics of these patients, uh, a little bit different than other gastroparesis uh, indications. This included not just idiopathic diabetic, but also post-surgical uh, and, and multifactorial. So a pretty uh, broad spectrum of patients. Operative time was about 33 minutes. Most of these were done in the operating room, but we have transitioned to do these in the endoscopy suite now. 10% overall complications, two bleeds requiring uh, either transfusion or reintervention and one diagnostic laparoscopy. Um, GCSI improved pre to post, uh, statistically significant, and most importantly, and different than a lot of the other surgical interventions for gastroparesis, the gastric emptying studies objectively approved in 78% of patients, with over half of them having normalized gastric emptying studies, which I think really separates this technique from some of the other surgical procedures out there. So in this session, we're talking about uh, notes and endoscopic applications of surgical procedures, but how does this match up against uh, the, the surgical standard, laparoscopic pyloroplasty? So our group also looked at laparoscopic pyloroplasty versus POP. We, we propensity score matched one to one, 30 patients in each arm of a laparoscopic heineken michelix pyloroplasty versus POP. We looked at perioperative outcomes, and again, GCSI scores and um, four-hour non-extrapolated gastric emptying studies. Two-thirds idiopathic, 20% post-surgical. I think a high number of those patients were especially challenging, uh, and nearly 20% were diabetics. Uh, in the laparoscopic pyloroplasty group, obviously they had a longer length of stay. This is a, a laparoscopic surgical procedure. Operative time is longer, <clears throat> and more complications, including surgical site infections uh, and pneumonia. Interestingly, though, if you look at the gastric emptying study in GCSI, improved in both groups, uh, pre and post, and there was no difference between the laparoscopic pyloroplasty uh, and POP patients. So in conclusion, intramural techniques allow a, a truly minimally invasive approach. Application to submucosal tumors of the proximal GI tract uh, for STIR uh, and gastroparesis is POP, offer new surgical endoscopic approaches mirroring our, our laparoscopic operations. Thank you very much for your attention.